Welcome to the wicket. Hello, and yes, it's another episode of The Wicket, a podcast from Arab News looking at the world of cricket locally in the Gulf, regionally across Asia and worldwide. I'm Brian Murgatroyd, and with me to discuss and analyse events across the globe are Arab News columnist John Pike and Arab News cricket reporter Sebash Hamagain. Hello, gentlemen. Uh, Good morning, Brian. Morning, Brian. And in a packed show this week... We talk about Saudi Arabia's triumph in the ACC Men's Challenger Cup in Thailand. We look back at two extraordinary one-day internationals between Sri Lanka and Afghanistan. We reflect upon the first test of the controversial South Africa's men's tour of New Zealand. We assess selection challenges for both India and England as the two teams readied themselves to resume their test series. We speak about another remarkable Glenn Maxwell performance in the T20i series between Australia and the West Indies. We discuss the Australia-South Africa Women's One Day International Series. We chat 2020 cricket, looking at the SA20 in South Africa and the DP World ILT20 in the UAE. We wrap up an ICC Under-19 Cricket World Cup that produced some compelling cricket and John and Sebash give us their headlines of the past week in cricket. So, as ever, lots to cover. Let's get started. We start this week with some regional news, and Saudi Arabia has won the Asian Cricket Council Men's Challenger Cup in Bangkok, Thailand. Saudi Arabia, under Captain Hisham Sheikh, beat Cambodia by five wickets in the final, successfully chasing the 148 they needed with 15 balls to spare. Sheikh was the hero in that final, with a timely unbeaten 47 in 41 balls, after his side were tested for perhaps the first time in the tournament, slipping to 37 for three in their chase. Cambodia was the other big story of the event, winning through to the final, having started off in the qualifying tournament alongside China and Myanmar. The all-important matches were the semi-finals, as the winners of those games qualified for the ACC Premier Cup in Oman in April. Saudi Arabia crushed Japan by 10 wickets, and Cambodia overcame Singapore by 6 wickets. Singapore's eight-wicket win then over Japan in the third and fourth place playoff was a small consolation, but they'll be bitterly disappointed at missing out on that Oman event, which is the feeder tournament for the 2025 Asia Cup. John, Saudi Arabia were the defending champions in this tournament and were favourites, but all the same, this is an important win for them in the development of the sport in the kingdom, isn't it? It certainly is. Uh, It keeps them on track with their planned development. They were unbeaten in their five matches, winning them comfortably, though uh, Cambodia put up a strong fight in the final, as you pointed out. It has their achievement in winning the ODI Challenger competition last year. And what is worth highlighting is that a final involving uh, Saudi Arabia and Cambodia played in Thailand features countries that many people would not believe are involved with international cricket. Yes, that's a real positive for the sport. There's no question about that. Sebash, you spoke about Cambodia and their reliance on expats in the previous podcast. All the same, it's still a tremendous effort, isn't it, to fight through the qualifier to reach the next step on the road to the Asia Cup, isn't it? I think we'll beat Singapore, who were inconsistent until the very end. Uh, I think Cambodia deservedly are in the Premier Cup now. And they formed this team just last April, and I think they're now fighting against the top associates. As I said, the, the expats once again proved to be the difference, but I hope this success will push the board to introduce the and more develop, development programs which will ultimately help in growing the game. Yes, we keep our fingers crossed about that. The eight teams waiting for Saudi Arabia and Cambodia in the ACC Premier Cup are Bahrain, Hong Kong, Kuwait, Malaysia, Nepal, Oman, Qatar and the United Arab Emirates. John, do you think Saudi Arabia and Cambodia will be able to make the step up against these sides? 
This is a very tough pack of opposition, all with a pedigree of playing at a higher level than, than Saudi Arabia, for whom it's really going to be tough. I know they're up for it. I mean, I've spoken with them. It is T20, which one outstanding performance can win a match or, or even one ball. In the 2023 uh, Premier Cup, they did beat Qatar. They lost to Malaysia and Oman in a high-scoring match and didn't get to play Nepal. And the match was abandoned. I think with both teams, it will be part of their continuing development. They won't be expected to finish at the top, but the more they play and the more they're able to train together as part-timers, then the better they'll get. Sebastian Nepal and and the UAE are the two heavy hitters in the Premier Cup. Do you see it being a battle between those two sides again come April? Um, Brad, of course, they are the favourites, but uh, Oman, they are preparing for the World Cup too, so it won't be an easy task. Uh, I think uh, Saudi Arabia is a dark horse for this tournament uh, with the quality of players they have. The previous edition held in Nepal, I think it was played in a one-day format, but uh, was very competitive. The teams who anyone could have beaten anyone, and in the sort of version, I think it's going to be more closely contested. Uh, I'm excited to see the group divisions already because that's going to, the permutations are going to be calculated from the group divisions itself. Yes, uh, they will be fascinating to see who plays who in which group. You can find plenty more on the ACC Challenger Cup and Saudi Arabia cricket at the Arab News website. That includes reports by Richard Lockwood on the Saudi matches in Bangkok. It's all at www dot arabnews dot com forward slash cricket. I can add that there is also an interview which I did with the development officer of the Japan Cricket Association, um, which looks at um, how they've come from literally nowhere um, onto the uh, international stage. Yes, that's uh, full of cricket information. That particular area of the Arab News uh, website. So please go along and uh, enjoy yourself. As we record this podcast on Wednesday morning, the third One Day International between Sri Lanka and Afghanistan is taking place, and we'll chat about that together with the T20i series to follow in the next episode. But in the meantime, it's worth speaking about the first two One Day Internationals of the series in Palakele, because both produced extraordinary happenings. The margins of victory for Sri Lanka, 42 runs and 155 runs, don't sound remarkable, but the contents of those matches most certainly were. In the first of them, Sri Lanka's Patam Nasanka became only the 10th player and the first Sri Lankan to score a double hundred in a one-day international as he made an unbeaten 210 from 139 balls to lead his side to a seemingly impregnable 381 for three. It looked even more so after Afghanistan slipped to 55 for five in reply, but then uh, Amatzula Omazai with 149 not out from 115 deliveries and Mohammed Nabi, who made 136, they added 242 for the sixth wicket, the second highest stand for that wicket in one day international history. Certainly gave Sri Lanka a scare. They had no such scare, though, in game two. Quite the opposite, in fact. This time Sri Lanka made 308 for six, with Charith Asalanka weighing in with an unbeaten 97. And then, after Afghanistan had reached 143 for two, they lost their last eight wickets for 10 runs, with Wanindu Hasaranga back from the DP World ILT20, taking four for 27. John, it's good to see Sri Lanka's batters putting up big scores on the board, isn't it? Because batting has been an issue for them in one-day international cricket. I think particularly of the Cricket World Cup qualifier in Zimbabwe last year and also the Cricket World Cup itself. Yes, it has. Uh, they've been in constant. Consistent, to say the least. They reached the Asia Cup last year, but then were all out for 50 against India. In the World Cup, they won, won only two matches out of nine. Had two scores of over 300, which were not enough. Had four over 200, of which only one was enough. They did beat England, though, chasing with 160. It was interesting after that second one-day international to hear Chris Silverwood, the Sri Lanka coach, talking about the need for his players to play on uh, better batting pitches. He thinks that brings out the best in the side. But from Afghanistan perspective, Sebash, there's a pattern that's developed here, isn't there? Just as was the case in the test match between the two teams, one or two players are making good contributions for the visitors 
but the rest of the batting is offering next to nothing. What, what's going on there, do you think? I think the problem has been the consistency lately. Uh, even in the Test Series, they had momentum, but then failed to carry it forward. Uh, they have not been able to perform as a unit. Like Jonathan Trott said, uh, the promising signs are there, but uh, if they are repeating the same mistakes time and again, I think it's not going to improve them on a long run. It will remain as a problem. So it was good to see Omar Zai producing all-round performance with uh, regular matches in his belt, but I think uh, there should be a collective effort uh, going forward. Yes, it's a problem for Afghanistan to find that consistency. Let's see if they can do it for the rest of the tour. Nabi, incidentally, became the sixth oldest player to score a one-day international 100, but he's still four years short of Kurum Khan of the UAE, that outstanding batter who uh, achieved the feat aged 43, ironically, against Afghanistan in November 2014. After the final one-day international of the series, there are three 2020 internationals to come, all part of both sides' preparations for the ICC T20 World Cup. The second test of the New Zealand-South Africa test series is underway in Hamilton as we record this podcast, and we'll discuss it in the next episode. But in the meantime, let's talk about the first test that was played in Mount Monganui. The build-up to the series was dominated by the fact South Africa had sent a second string team on the tour as their frontline players were being kept at home to play in the now-finished SA20. And sure enough, New Zealand steamrolled a side featuring six debutants in that opening encounter, winning by 281 runs in four days, with Rachin Ravindra scoring 240 and Kane Williamson making hundreds in each innings. John, no surprise in this result, given that build-up that we've spoken of already. Where do you stand on the rights and wrongs of what happened? Do you have sympathy for South Africa, wanting to maximise the quality of its own T20 tournament? Are you unhappy with their cheapening of Test cricket, which is crippling their chances, incidentally, of qualifying for the World Test Championship final? Or do you feel a mix of both or, or something else uh, besides? Well, instinctively, I'm unhappy with the cheapening of test cricket. But, you know, I accept there is a new world of cricket um, out there now. CSA's desire to secure its financial future is understandable, uh, given past failures in setting up a T20 competition. So I can see why, but I don't really have any sympathy. The wind of change has blown and there's been an Indianization of the game. And there seems to be no antidote to this. The old model's broken, and I guess we we need to accept that that's the case and see how it pans out. Indeed. Uh, Sebash, from your perspective, were there any crumbs of comfort for South Africa from that mauling in the first test? Well, they certainly didn't come here with result in mind. I think at the second string side, they they had some individual moments. Uh, Players like David Beringham, Neil Brand stepping up, but this will help uh, South Africa to strengthen their brains in future series, but I think uh, the result is out of of, uh, reach at the moment. But uh, these new players, they can use this experience from the first match uh, in the coming matches of the series. Yes, Beddingham, who debuted against India in December, scored 87 in the second innings and left arm spinner Neil Brand one of those six debutants took eight wickets John you'll obviously as president of the Ratchin Ravindra fan club have been delighted at his double hundred but how important were Kane Williamson's two hundreds given all the injury issues he's gone through in the recent past. Well, it's a very pleasing outcome. I mean, people will say that a player of his calibre should score those runs. But the impressive thing is that he seems to have come through unscathed. And for anyone who appreciates classic, high-quality batting, it's a good omen. But sadly, in view of what we've just talked about, a sight that may well become scarcer. Yes, uh, it will be interesting to see what happens to not only South Africa, but uh, plenty of other test sides around the world and and whether they can keep their uh, top players on the field for the long game. Sebastian, New Zealand were the winners of the inaugural ICC World Test Championship. Do you think the makeup of their side means they're contenders to uh, regain that title from Australia in this cycle? I think they can be the one of the contenders this time as well. Uh, Lutzin is batting. I think he's cemented the place in long format now. Uh, Kane, I think, is doing what he does the best uh, usually. The batting looks solid as ever, but uh, on the bowling front, I'd like to see spin options added with two, two subcontinent in mind. Uh, pace-wise, I think they have a good bowling unit and they could be the contenders this time. Well, we'll discuss the second test of this series, the one taking place in Hamilton, on our next episode. Two tests down, the series locked at 1-1 and three matches to go in the India-England test series. 
and we'll talk about the third test in Rajkot in our next podcast. But for the time being, let's look at the challenges both sides are facing. The visitors first. They've lost Jack Leach for the series after he's failed to recover from the knee injury he picked up in the first test. But interestingly, they've opted against calling up a replacement and have instead put their faith in Tom Hartley, Shoaib Bashir and Rehan Ahmed to carry the weight of spin expectations. John, is this sensible given the fact there are three back-to-back tests to come and three very inexperienced spinners? I don't see a problem with it. Indeed, is there an alternative? Rashid's not available. These young men can only learn from the experience of being dropped in at the deep end. And there is Joe Root, of course, and Dan Lawrence is in the squad. And I note that he did open the bowling for the uh, Desert Vipers against the Warriors earlier this week. Maybe a request had come through for him to do that. Well, there's also uh, Liam Dawson, of course, who uh, played successfully for Hampshire last summer. He's got test experience as well, but it looks as though, for whatever reason, he's being overlooked by the England selectors. But as for India... They're going to be without Virat Kohli for the rest of the series as he continued his absence from action for personal reasons. And KL Raoul, who was injured in the first test, has been ruled out of a return for the third test. Sebash, uh, that absence of KL Raoul represents a reprieve for KS Barat as Raoul was tipped by some to replace him behind the stumps. But are India in trouble without Raul and Kohli, or do they have the quality to cope? I think Bharat is still under scrutiny with his lack of runs. Uh, maybe India will go with Zurel instead, uh, younger and fresh options behind the stumps. Uh, Batting-wise, not having Kohli and Raul will be tough. I think South Paras finally looks like getting that cap, but uh, it will be a huge task for these youngsters to fill in the season campaign. Uh, Kohli's presence, I think it's not just with the batting, but uh, it's important for the team to uh, be the motivator, I think. I think uh, even for, for the opposition, I think he brings in that flavour of test cricket for the fans as well, extra bit of entertainment that has been long lost. Well, we'll chat about that third test in Rajkot next time. The West Indies men's tour of Australia has wrapped up with a T20i series after a drawn two test series and a clean sweep for Australia in the three one-day internationals. The 2020 international series proved to be high scoring, with Australia topping 200 in each of the first two matches to take an unbeatable lead, before the West Indies did likewise in Game 3 to secure a convincing consolation victory. In that final game, the West Indies actually scored 41 in their final two overs, including 28 off uh, Adam Zampa's final over by Andre Russell. And Russell made 38 in total off his final nine balls face. That was exceptional. John Glenn Maxwell, who was rested for the one-day international series, he came back for the 2020s and produced a stunning innings in match two in Adelaide, where he reached 150 balls, his fifth three-figure score in the international format, the joint most alongside India's Rohit Sharma. He's had an incredible few months on the field, hasn't he? When uh, you think back to the World Cup as well and that uh, wonderful 100 against the Dutch and also a double 100, an unforgettable double 100 against Afghanistan, both in the World Cup. Yes, since um, October the 25th, that match against the Netherlands, he's battered for Australia in five ODIs and four T20s, scored four centuries. 597 runs, there's an average of 117, supported by four not outs, and a strike rate of 186. Um, this means he's scored 11 runs and over off his own bat. Um, he also seems to be able to match those fireworks off the field. Yes, he does. There was a little bit of controversy during the One Day International uh, series when he became uh, tired and emotional on uh, a night out, but he's put all that behind him with that innings in Adelaide and what an incredible strike rate that is uh, as you say John scoring at almost 11 runs per over on his own goodness me you wouldn't want to be a bowler in that situation Sebash the West Indies T20i side it's a team full of stars who ply their trade in the franchise leagues around the world but despite their individual credentials they couldn't live with the Australian batting power in those first two games why was that do you think I can't help thinking it was because that 
several of them were jet lagged at the start of the series. They'd flown in just a matter of a couple of days before match one in Hobart. I know, for example, that Sherfane Rutherford left the UAE on Tuesday morning and was then playing in Hobart in match one on Friday afternoon, less than 48 hours after that long trip. And I don't think it's any coincidence that he only showed his best in match three, the final game of the series in Perth, when he produced 67 not out in 40 balls. Have you got a theory on this, uh, Sebash? Uh, Brian, certainly, I think uh, I'll have to add to that because the 3020 did give us some serious hitting from Russell and Rutherford once they got settled in. I think the franchise league has had identity of these players that they can hit anywhere because they play for different teams, have got the similar roles. But when they come up, I think the West Indies is spoiled for choices that they have, I think. They couldn't live up to the expectation. And Australia, on the other hand, I think they look well-placed ahead of the World Cup. I think Warner is in good form and they've got their roles defined for the team. Whereas West Indies, I think they're still trying to find out what's the best combination in batting order. Uh, if you see Australia, I think Team David was exceptional in all three, remain not out, might be the player to differentiate the World Cup trophy as well. So I think uh, the difference between the two teams would be that uh, they've got their balance sorted out. Yes, a serious loss for the West Indies, but that follows on from their 3-2 success against England in the Caribbean in December. And of course, the Caribbean and the USA in June is where the next T20 World Cup is going to be taking place. John, where do you think this series, Australia against West Indies, leaves the two teams ahead of that uh, global event? As Sebastian said, I think Australia is well-placed and well-prepared. West Indies is still a work in progress. It's difficult to get their wandering troops together and uh, it's not very easy for selectors or coaches. Yes, there's no doubt it's uh, problematic for those uh, West Indies administrators to try and get the what, what you would almost call the Harlem Globetrotters of cricket together in one place at the same time. But maybe it'll be a case of uh, it'll be all right on the night. We'll see come June. But Sebash, talk to us about a bizarre incident in the second match of the series in Adelaide, where Australia ran out Alzari Joseph, or they thought they did. It was ruled not out by umpire Gerald Aboud because he said there'd been no appeal. In order for an umpire to give a player out, there has to be an appeal by the fielding side, and Aboud said there wasn't one. What did you make of it? Well, they did not make the appeal after all. I think that this is the so uh, they had to appeal for the umpire to give the decision or even to send upstairs. But I think the umpire was aware of the situation. He took notice of that. And I had, I'd have to say that Australia learned a lesson and this time it, it didn't cost them dear. Yes, uh, when there was an appeal for a run out in the third match in Perth, I think all 11 Australians on the ground uh, all appealed in unison. As we record this podcast, Australia and South Africa's women are preparing for a test match at the Wacker Ground in Perth, and we'll chat about that next time. But in the meantime, we can reflect on the One Day International series between the two teams that, like the T20I series before it, finished in a 2-1 success for the hosts. The One Day Internationals were part of the Women's Championship that helps determine qualification for the 2025 Women's World Cup. And both Australia and South Africa look secure in the top six, the places that command automatic uh, spots in that tournament. After Australia won the first match of this series very easily by eight wickets, something we covered in the previous episode, South Africa bounced back superbly winning match two by 84 runs, thanks to Marazan Cap. The all-rounder who injured her left arm in match one bounced back to score 75 in 87 balls, and then she backed that up with three for 12. But Australia, as so often is the case, they won the match that counted the series decider by 110 runs, as Beth Mooney once again excelled with an unbeaten 82. Sebash, Alyssa Healy called her side sloppy, after that defeat in the second game. It's odd to hear a captain criticising her players like that, but I wonder, is it fair comment? That's three losses in the home summer for the Australians now, as well as a Test and 2020 international loss in India too. They're still a winning machine, but I just wonder, has that aura of invincibility slipped a little following on from a drawn multi-format series in England last year? 
I think Hilly's comment just proves how demanding the team is at the moment. They barely lose and even when they do such comments mean the team doesn't expect any slip-ups. And South Africa might be the best, next best after Australia at the moment. They have good players. The game that Australia lost wasn't as competitive but I think the Marijan cap was a special innings from her coming back with the ball as well and the slip-up, I think the comment after that, I think Australia took the game seriously and the third game, they, they were back to the best. John, are you encouraged by South Africa's efforts on this tour with wins in both the T20i and ODI format, something I'm not sure any of us predicted beforehand. Very encouraged. Uh, they won the second of the three T20s last month, followed up with this uh, win, uh, ODI, 84 runs, the first ever defeat of Australia in an ODI. Admittedly, uh, the host dropped five catches, back to the, to the comment about them being sloppy, but they also had an unusual and calamitous batting collapse. And uh, so I think full credit to uh, South Africa, who uh, appeared to be getting stronger. It's a good effort from South Africa, and we'll cover off that test match between the two teams in our next podcast. But one other piece of uh, women's news for you. Hot on the heels of the Asian Cricket Council's Men's Challenger Cup has come the ACC Women's Premier Cup with 16 teams, including five from the Gulf region. That's Bahrain, Kuwait, Oman, Qatar and the UAE, battling for two spots to join Bangladesh, India, Pakistan and Sri Lanka this September. The tournament is taking place in Thailand with the final on February the 19th and we'll wrap things up for you in our next episode. Let's talk DP World ILT20 now and at the time of recording the group stage of the UAE's own T20 tournament has reached the playoffs with MI Emirates defending champions Gulf Giants, Abu Dhabi Knight Riders and the Dubai Capitals winning through, leaving last season's runners-up, the Desert Vipers and Sharjah Warriors, to miss out. We'll wrap up the tournament in our next episode, but in the meantime, there are a couple of stories we can discuss. Sebash, I don't think anyone saw the Desert Vipers missing out. In the end, their uh, two final ball losses to Dubai Capitals cost them dear and with a difference between missing out and even a spot in the top two. What went so wrong for such a star-studded team? And with two matches to go, they were well-placed to make it through. But losing against the teams who were fighting for that same spot was tough. On paper, they were always the favourites. But uh, I think a lot of Indian now this time made it tough for them. All said, I think batting-wise, they only crossed to 170 once, never over 180. And you're playing against such teams full of... Uh, world-class players and you've not got enough runs on the board apart from Wales. I think uh, others could not do their best and similar on the bowling side as well. They struggled from start. Yes, it really was a problem for the Desert Vipers in terms of batting. They couldn't get big enough scores on the board consistently enough. And in the end, it cost them dear. John, there's been chat around the event about uh, a change of window for the next edition with whispers that November is being considered. That's November this year for uh, edition three. On the one hand, that would take it away from the busy January period where multiple competitions are vying for players. And it would also stop it butting up against the Champions Trophy that's penciled in for February of next year. But on the other hand, it would put it in a time slot where due in the UAE would be a major factor as it was during the T20 World Cup in 2021, where it was a case of win the toss, bowl first and win the match. What do you think is the right way to go? Shouldn't the ILT20 try to own that January slot, as it's a really attractive tournament, or would they be right to give it up next season? Oh, this is an interesting one. There's no doubt that the calendar's crowded by a franchise cricket in January and February, and that the merry-go-round of players is rather farcical and unsettling for team planning purposes. There is a window in November, something that's been talked about as a possible opportunity for Saudi Arabia, but it doesn't have the facilities to host a tournament of its own, even if it wanted to. As you mentioned, we've got the Champions Trophy in February, scheduled for Pakistan. Of course, the elephant in the room there is is, is India. If it happens in Pakistan, this affects the Pakistan um, Super League. And then there's Ramadan to take into account, I think, which starts uh, next year on March, I think it's March the 1st. So I think the Pakistan Super League would need to be the first 
actor uh, in this um, in this House of Cards scenario. As for Dune winning the toss, let's have a look at the ILT 2024. 20, uh, in 27 of the 30 group um, matches, the side winning the toss chose to bowl. Two of the three exceptions were by the um, Dubai Capitals, and they probably wouldn't do it again. And golf giants in the afternoon match the um, the Night Riders in the 27 insertions, 60 percent of the teams won. So clear majority, but obviously not as skewed as it was in the, in the World Cup to which you refer. So quite a lot to con- take into account in in this conundrum. Who would be an administrator, eh? Well, we'll okay. discuss we'll discuss the final stages of uh, the tournament in our next podcast. The SA20 has wrapped up in South Africa. We've already chatted about the knock-on effect of it taking place in the window it has done, costing the South Africa test side its best players for the tour of New Zealand. But there's no doubt, too, it captured the imagination of the public in South Africa with good crowds and a retained title as well for the Sunrisers Eastern Cape, who beat the Durban Supergiants in the final. That was a one-sided match in the end, with the Sunrisers winning by 89 runs after posting an imposing 204 for three. They'll feel it was a fair reflection of their dominance throughout the tournament too, as they won three of the four encounters with the Durban Supergiants in the tournament. Interestingly, the Supergiants had two of the three leading run scorers in the tournament, with Heinrich Klassen and Matthew Britsky, with Klassen doing to bowlers the same sort of thing he did to England's attack in the Cricket World Cup. He scored his runs at an incredible strike rate of 207 runs per 100 balls. But as if to illustrate that even in short-form cricket, it's bowlers who win you trophies, the Sunrisers had two of the top performers in all-rounder Marco Janssen and Dan Worrell, and in the end, that proved crucial. John, it's being viewed as a success in South Africa and by South Africa. But if it retains this window of January and the other competing leagues do the same, do you think it can retain its pulling power with overseas players? There's a lot of water to flow under the bridge in franchise cricket between now and January uh, 25, as discussed above. We know the salary cap in SA20 was lower than in IOT20 this year. No, but then who would not be attracted by a winter in South Africa, in which there is a significant English uh, contingent? I think we need to wait until we see if there are any date changes in the other franchises before forming a view. Sebash, SA20 didn't go down the route of the ILT20 with super subs, but again opted to allow captains to confirm teams after the toss rather than before it. Do you think this gimmick, for want of a better word, and the super sub or impact player, as it's called in the IPL, is uh, is worthwhile? Personally, I'm not a fan of these experimentations. Uh, Teams sit after the toss will not have as big impact uh, like super sub or impact player, but I think uh, that's like playing with 12 players but fielding with 11 at a time. As I said in earlier podcast, uh, cricket with 11 players will test teams' combinations, playing the fifth baller or making use of two all-rounders for the fifth quota, and even the oppositions, they will wait for the part-timer to come and have a go. So I think, but with this super sub, I think they're swapping baller and batter in either innings and the balance is all gone. The ICC Under-19 Cricket World Cup has wrapped up in South Africa and it's been won for a fourth time by Australia. They overcame India comfortably in the end by 79 runs in the final in Benoni with their pace attack proving too strong. The match followed two cracking semi-finals with Australia edging past Pakistan by just one wicket in a low-scoring thriller while India overcame the hosts South Africa by two wickets after at one stage being 32 for four, chasing 245. They were assisted on that occasion by Captain Uday Saharan with 81 and Sachin Das with 96. Saharan was the top scorer in the tournament with 396 runs, but he wasn't player of the tournament. That honour went to South Africa's fast bowler, Kwene Mapaka, who took 21 wickets in six matches at an average of less than 10. The tournament included 41 matches over 23 days. And remember, it was put together very hurriedly after Sri Lanka was suspended by the ICC and in the face of taking place at the same time as the SA20. John, simple question. Was it a success? It certainly was for Australia, if not for 
India or England, for that matter. Australia ended a stretch of 14 years without winning this trophy. As Mitch Marsh led them in 2010, a year when England was captained by Azim Rafiq. Um, overall, I would say yes, especially given the short notice. But did it receive sufficient attention given the competing interests of franchise cricket? I suspect not despite the best efforts of the ICC. Sebash, looking at it through the lens of someone who follows associate cricket, and Nepal in particular very closely, what were your impressions of the tournament? Uh, Result-wise, I think we didn't have much sucks like uh, we did in the senior World Cup, but Nepal being the only associate in Super 6 was great to see beating Afghanistan when getting two big games uh, with India and Bangladesh. Uh, like we expected, a change in venue meant uh, Sri Lanka underperformed. Uh, Bangladesh and India, along with Pakistan, they had good pace bowlers who impressed as well, but uh, even in the wicket takers list, I think the pace bowlers dominated the chart and Sri Lanka did, didn't make most of it. John, can we expect to see Saharan Mavpaka, Somi Pandey, the India left-arm spinner who took 19 wickets, or any of the Australia squad making waves at senior level anytime soon? Well, you might recall before the tournament, I had seven tips to watch out for. Four of them didn't really fire. Uh, the most successful were Dixon and Mavpaka and Stolp of South Africa. Um, are they going to play anytime soon? I think India's got such strength in depth, it's probably unlikely, as do Australia. So I would think that of them all, Mapak has probably got the best chance of an earlier call-up. Sebash, did the format of three teams from each of the four groups going through to the Super 6 stage work? Or is that something the ICC needs to revisit? I think they need to look after that because uh, some teams were out before they played any matches in the Super 6. And same was in the case in the both the groups. I think carrying points forward and playing just two matches should be changed. At least they should play every other teams in the group so that there could be a scenario that even the third or second or third place teams can top the group. I think uh, taking only two matches in Super 6 and bringing the third team, I think that, that that's a no-brainer that it should be changed. Well, it'll be interesting to see if the ICC does go down that route, because of course, uh, more matches means uh, a longer tournament, and a longer tournament means more expense, so uh, we'll have to see where those purse strings uh, stand uh, when it comes to that next edition. And the next edition of the tournament, that's in Zimbabwe and Namibia, and it's due to take place in 2026. Finally, gentlemen, what has caught your attention from the past week in cricket? What uh, has it been? Sebash, first of all? I think it has to be Nepal's clean sweep over Canada and the new uh, new players making comeback. I think that they put the case for the League 2 series and there has been a change in squad. So I think the League 2 series that's starting this week uh, will see a new look Nepal team as well. Just talk to us, Sebash, about that uh, League 2 uh, series coming up. Who's playing and uh, what are you looking forward to about that? So the the League 2 cycle starts this week with the Namibia and Netherlands visiting Nepal, where we had a grandstand closer last cycle. So Netherlands and Namibia are already here. Nepal's just back from the clean sweep against Canada series. So looking forward to a fascinating tournament. Yes, uh, I know Bas Delader was on the plane straight away after the final match of the Desert Vice. Piper's ILT20 on his way to Kathmandu for the tournament. So you've got uh, that to look forward to, seeing him in the flesh, uh, Sebash over the course of the League Two event. John, what's tickled your fancy? Well, I uh, was most impressed by James Vince's captaincy masterclass in IOT20 for the Gulf Giants in the last two matches of the group stage, which, um, of course, would propel them into um, second position. Yes, he's a very skillful operator, James Vince, and he's been once again one of the most effective batters in the tournament, despite, if truth be told, it being quite testing for top order batters against the new ball in the uh, ILT20. It'll be uh, very, very interesting indeed to see who comes out on top in that tournament. As I mentioned earlier, we'll wrap things up for the ILT20 in our next episode. The Gulf Giants, James Vince's side, they're the defending champions. Remember, they beat the Desert Vipers in the inaugural final. Well, that's all for us here at The Wicket. We'll be back soon with more cricket chat from the Gulf region, Asia and worldwide. Please don't forget to like, subscribe and comment on what you've heard wherever you get your podcast. We'd love to hear your feedback and let us know if there's anything you'd like us to feature in future episodes. For now, though, this is Brian Murgatroyd, along with John Pike and Sebastian again, saying thanks so much for listening and we look forward to your company next time. <laughs>